Welcome to the uh, topic of germ theory and modern information security threats. Um, as Ray said, I'm Joe Grettenberger. I'm the compliance manager at NetDocuments. And this is my colleague Dave, uh, who works with me in the compliance department there. Uh, we both work for David Hansen, who was here last year. So we'll be talking today about um, some perspectives on cyber threats. Um, and uh, how uh, some definitions of data breaches and so on that we're seeing uh, out there in, in, in the American Bar Association and some others. We'll also be talking about how germ theory relates to information security. I'll give you a little story of Igne Samelweis, uh, who was a uh, doctor in the mid-1800s. Um, and we'll be talking about good uh, good hygiene habits with cyber risk, and uh, what a chlorine solution would look like. A chlorine solution going back to Samelweis's theory um, for how to prevent contamination, and then uh, some current programs that are available for cyber hygiene, and then we'll hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end. One of the things we want to uh, address as we, as we get into this in our first section here on perspectives and definitions, one of the things that we perceive, at least anecdotally, is that there's a little, there's a, a growing, oh, sorry, growing complacency, thanks in the back there, growing complacency about uh, data breaches. Who, I mean, we hear about them in the news, and the next day they're gone. Now, the individual companies are still putting out fires, but the people we work with, the employees we work with, that we oversee, are at great risk of being com becoming complacent about the risks that we face and the things they need to do to respond to it. So we put up a couple of perspectives uh, quotes here. Roy kind of stole our thunder with the first one, the uh, quote from Robert Mueller about there being two kinds of companies, ones that have been hacked and ones that will be hacked again. But I also wanted to throw in the uh, perspective of somebody who's actually had their data stolen. There was a great article uh, in the uh, Christian Science Monitor where somebody talks about what it was like to have their identity stolen. You know, the information we're talking about belongs to people, and when we don't control it properly when it gets out there, real lives are affected. And I like the part of this thing here, the, this Jonathan Franklin, who is not his real name, of course, says, somebody, knowing somebody stole my personal information and broke in my world, didn't feel any different from getting physically robbed, okay? And then, he, the underlying sense of anxiety we're that we're still not through this with the amount of information they have and the skills they obviously possess, this could be just a recurring thing for God knows how long, okay? So for the people that this, who are affected by these data breaches, the individual users, you know, once the horse is out of the barn, it's always out of the barn. And that's something, that's a perspective that it's worthwhile for us to keep. Um, now, uh, we didn't gear our presentation particularly for lawyers, but the vast majority of our customer base are law firms uh, and, uh, and their clients. So we wanted to bring in a couple of perspectives from the Bar Association. They've gotten given uh, two formal opinions about data security in the last little while. And of course, they revamped the model rules in 2012. But the key thing to point out is law firms in particular have been complacent over the years. But law firms are targets of, of cyber secure, uh, at risk for hacking for two reasons. They store and use highly sensitive information, and at the same time, their safeguards are not as strong as those their clients have in place. And what the information the lawyers have is distilled down, right? So the lawyers have the juicy stuff, and they're not protecting it as well as the client does. And so law firms are increasingly at risk and need to be aware of that. And people who hire law firms need to realize that their law firms are increasingly at risk and make sure that their lawyers are doing the things they need to do, the, the, taking reasonable steps in light of the information uh, involved uh, to protect it. And then, of course, these two classic quotes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and we have met the enemy, and he is us. And we'll go into that in some more detail. Um, another thing here, what actually, let's talk about what as a breach. There's two quotes here that actually represent two different perspectives, slightly different perspectives. There's the one from the GAO report uh, about the Equifax breach in 2017. And they cover you know, what goes out uh, and what the loss of a data means. 
So generally an author unauthorized or unintentional exposure, disclosure, or loss of an organization's sensitive information. And again, they take the position that it's the organiz organization sensitive information, but I want to emphasize the point that that, it, and from the GDPR perspective we just heard about, it's an individual person's information that's been lost, and that's, that's critical, critical and should help us motivate, help motivate us in our efforts to protect this information better. But the ABI, ABA, in their formal opinion, issued last October about a lawyer's obligations after a breach, goes at one better. So a breach includes a data event where material client information is misappropriated, destroyed, or otherwise compromised, or where a lawyer's ability to perform the legal services for which the lawyer is hired is significantly impaired by the episode. This now covers ransomware attacks. Okay? So if you can't get to your information, you can't do the work for your client, that's also a breach. So we're taking, it, uh, those in the, in the uh, security world have vocabulary that's borrowed from multiple disciplines, such as military, combat, espionage, uh, we talk about reconnaissance, uh, threats, tactics, procedures. We also borrow language from law enforcement when we talk about MMO, um, black market, surveillance. And lastly, but not least, we borrow language from healthcare medicine and germ theory when we talk about cyber incidents. Um, things like boundaries and infections and immunizing uh, sometimes. Um, we, we're going to focus in on that third category today as we talk about how we think we can educate folks more broadly uh, because we can borrow language in healthcare and in medicine uh, to help educate folks in this area. Oh, and one other thing here I wanted to mention is, um, you know, when it comes to food service industry, we get folks certified before they handle our food because of contaminants. Um, when it comes to drawing blood, we get folks certified to draw blood. But when it comes to data, we don't require certification uh, necessarily, especially on the front lines where people are dealing with this data day in and day out. So an epidemic, epidemiologist, <laughs> um, a person who deals with um, healthcare, um, this person is skilled at looking at cause and effect in, uh, in healthcare. Um, we have security researchers that do the same in, in cybersecurity. Um, DNA is similar to computer code. I won't go through the list here, but there's a lot of similarities between uh, what we do in healthcare and what we study uh, in the body versus uh, the corporate body. So we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Um, this is the story of Ingnes Samelweis. Um, the, so there was a germ theory of infectious diseases. It, um, it, it was brought about in the 1800s, and it wasn't accepted as, um, as authoritative at all. In fact, th there was a lot of deaths happening in, in the 1800s, is, in some hospitals, as much as 38% of women and children died uh, because of the ignorance of germ, germ theory. And today, if infectious computer attacks are increasing at an alarming rate, and our attitude could be similar to what, what was happening in the 1800s. So Igne Samelweis was a physician uh, in a maternity ward, and he found that when he required his doctors to wash their hands in a chlorine solution, that the death rate, the, the infant mortality rate, and the mater maternity mortality rate went down from 18% eight, from to 2%. Um, these doctors were coming in from uh, other operations. In some cases, they were dealing with cadavers. And their patients, when, when they delivered babies, the germs would carry over, and they would die. Um, so, and he tried to, he actually wrote a paper, he tried to get this out, and he was rejected back in the 1800s. Um, and we believe that there's an ignorance today that's out there that's similar to what was going on back in the 1800s. So, Dave, you want to take this one? Okay. So, what is due diligence for cybersecurity? What, what is... Um, the core 
party solution. So Semmelweis tried to get, got his staff, tried to get other doctors. <laughs> Sorry, I tend to gesticulate as I speak, and if I've got the microphone in the wrong hand, I'm stuck. Um, uh, to get it, but he couldn't get the medical community as a whole. And getting that information out is, is, is the challenge. One of the things, as we face the risk of, of, of complacency, we as organizations, well, as individuals, carrying us this healthcare germ theory metaphor a little farther, as individuals, we get sick. We have colds, flu, pneumonia, and we get, we get better and we move on. We get sick again sometime later, we get better, we move on. Yes. But we don't know. I had, I had a, I, you'll hear me cough a little bit. I spent most of, Feb, most of February with flu and pneumonia in spite of the fact that I had a flu shot. And the doctor says to me at one point, says, Dave, after, I, after I've gotten over the flu and now have pneumonia, my doctor says to me, Dave, you know, most people that die of the flu actually die of the post-secondary pneumonia. And I'm going, I can't tell you how much better that makes me feel. Thank you very much. <laughs> But, but the point is true. We never know as we get complacent about, ah, it's just another cold, just another flu, we'll be fine. You never actually know which one of those is going to get you. And as, as business organizations, law firms and other enterprises, you know, we never know what bad thing that might come across is just another incident versus the one that's going to get us. So look at this slide here. And Joe... So on the, on the left, we have a picture of a cell that's being attacked by viruses. There's attacks happening all around the perimeter here. Um, and uh, on the right, we have an artistic's conception, artist's conception of attacks happening from around the world um, going to some organization. And, and anyone who deals in this space knows that your organization is constantly under attack. Your firewalls, they're just being attacked constantly. Now, the human body is constantly under attack as well from viruses. So there is a, a strong correlation here between the continual attacks that we see in the natural world with our bodies and the continual attacks that we see uh, in the cyber world. And hopefully this, again, this, meta, this, this relationship, this similarity is something we can use when we take it back to our organizations to uh, help people understand the risks. Um, just like, um, you know, doctors and doctors and hospitals and patients will, f you know, perform an examination after an outbreak to see what happened. We actually want to walk through one of these, um, the Equifax breach in a, uh, in a similar matter. So we're all familiar with what happened with Equifax. We're just going to summarize it. In March of 2017, and, and how, how a, a cyber illness evolves, for example. In March 2017, an unknown individual discovers a vulnerability in the Equifax's online dispute portal. This is the system that people were using when they found an error on their credit report that they were to go into Equifax, report it, and try to get it fixed. Uh, on May 13th, the vulnerability was exploited to steal terabytes of data over a 76-day period. In July, the Equifax security team finally discovers that this has been going on. And, of course, my favorite part of this, from August and September, their CIO is now selling his stock. And then September 7th, Equifax notifies all 50 state attorneys general that they've had a security breach. So what was stolen? 100, data on 145 million consumers. And again, the thing they broke into first was the dispute portal. And so what was in there was names, social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, driver's license numbers, credit card numbers, and dispute documents containing personal information, the utility bills the stuff people were using to prove that that's who they were, kind of the holy grail of, uh, of personal information. And what has happened as a result, and I love my, uh, I, I like it anyway, what I put in there, consequences, what consequences? So what's happened as a result? The Equifax CEO was allowed to resign instead of being fired, which made a huge difference in his compensation package, although he did lose his bonus for 2017. Got to keep another $90 million. Uh, criminal charges against the former CIO, sorry, I've got a typo there, and a developer who also was involved in inside trading. There have been some legal changes regarding reporting requirements that have been now iterated in our, the first two sessions here and allowing credit freezes, but there's been no enforcement act activity or actions by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or the FTC. So Dave, should, should Equifax <laughs> get away with this? Well, as a practical matter, they are, but... 
you know, this is one of those episodes where the torches and pitchfor pitchforks actually really came out. I uh, enjoyed the perspective of, perspective of Wired Magazine. When a bookstore or airline doesn't manage customer data well, then the company needs to compensate its customers for its negligence, accept its punishment and reform. But when a company's entire reason for being is managing individuals' most sensitive private financial data, and it fails spectacularly, it should not be further entrusted with that important responsibility. We shouldn't use the corporate death penalty lightly, but at this point, Equifax has lost its justification for its existence. This was a call for the attorney, for the attorney general of Georgia to file for the judicial dissolution of the Equifax Corporation. So this could have been the thing, and may still be, depending on how this all shakes out, because the story isn't finished yet, that actually kills Equifax or kills someone else. Okay? And we'll talk, uh, We'll come back to this here in just a second. Go ahead, Joe. Well, on that point, if Equifax survives, uh, it's an illustration of the complacency that Dave and I are trying to, to uh, point out here that our society is becoming more and more complacent about these breaches. So uh, when a corporation gets hit, uh, or sorry, when they get breached, you see the hit to the reputation, the share price goes down, you see lawsuits come out, fines, uh, credit protection fees, there are thousands of hours of cleaning up the mess that happen. Um, then you have to hire better IT staff, new uh, solutions, et cetera. Um, if we're not vigilant about cybersecurity and experience a breach, we suffer the consequences. Then these are slow surfacing consequences. We all, the other thing that we're seeing is not just complacency, but the kind of consequences and the, and the rate at which these consequences are being carried out is like in slow motion. This takes years for this stuff to happen. Um, so we don't see quick penalties uh, happening other than the reputation. But again, the, the uh, public's reaction to a breach is like, oh, another one happened. So let's see what happened last year. The top 10 data breaches last year that uh, that I found. Um, now these numbers are in terms of records access. Yeah, these were uh, yeah, records access. The first one was over a billion records were accessed. That was the ADAR project in India. Um, national IDs from Indian um, nationals were stolen. Um, then the, we have the Marriott Starwood breach. A half a billion records were stolen. Um, Exactus, three quarters of a billion. And you can see these are huge numbers, but when we see it on the, uh, in, the in the news, it's just another breach. By the way, uh, if you look at sources so far, there are sources tracking uh, to this year to date, 42 incidents. So, and we're what, 60 days and 90 days into the month, into the quarter, and sorry, into the year. So, you know, the rate, the incidents, this is only 10 from last year, but there's 42 so far this year involving substantial numbers of records. S yes, substantial. From companies involving, uh, you know, Oklahoma Department of Securities, Fortnite, Alaska Department of Health, Dunkin' Donuts, Facebook, University of Washington, Dow Jones, FEMA, a whole bunch of uh, organizations that should be doing a better job protecting their information that simply aren't. Notice uh, in the right column under exploit, you'll see I, I was able to capture at least for most of them how they were exploited. And these are examples, these are huge data breaches that are being exploited. Most of those actually could be, uh, have been prevented with basic cyber hygiene. Sorry, we'll be getting into that here in a few slides. So in healthcare, what do we do when an epidemic uh, threatens, uh, w when we see an outbreak threaten our, uh, our public? We, we understand the propagation vectors. We, we, we work hard to do that. We identify a population that's susceptible to the disease. We make sure that those checkups, those health checkups are happening. We educate our population. Uh, we, we emphasize the need to wash hands. Um, we evaluate uh, the successes and the failures that we're seeing out there as we're, as we're going through this. And then we repeat that process as necessary because obviously we're talking about human lives here and, and we want to save as many lives as possible. Now, how do infections in cyber happen? So in the cyber world, um, we have, th by the way, this is, uh, this is a model from the MITRE Corporation. 
and they've done an excellent job of showing the steps that attackers use uh, to prepare for an attack, um, and then the steps that hackers use when they attack. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, but basically what happens is the, they go on a, a recon job to figure out um, how they want to how they want to weaponize their tools, and then they deliver a payload, they do the exploit and the exfiltration. So we know how these infections happen. It's not like we don't understand them. We know pretty well how these infections happen and how the attacks are carried out. So why don't we do something about it? So coming back here to our Equifax case study, you know, just like in the health care world, you go back and understand what happened in the epidemic. Sorry. And uh, the, uh, so Equifax and their consultants did a, did a post-breach analysis and identified what happened and their weaknesses in uh, a few different areas here. So the first thing that they failed on was identifying the risk, identifying the problem or that they had a vulnerability. They'd actually received the cert notice of the vulnerability that needed to be patched on their servers uh, a couple of weeks before the breach. Unfortunately, their in-house mailing list was out of date, and so the person who was supposed to needed to receive the information about the needed patch didn't get the notice, right? So case in point, make sure your internal lines of communication are kept up to date and checked uh, regularly. They also actually were running a vulnerability scanner on their network and on their websites, but it hadn't been updated either. So they ran that vulnerability analysis a week after they got the cert notice and it didn't pick it up. There's a problem there. The next area of, of weakness was in detection. They actually had an expired digital certificate that kept their network traffic scanner from recognizing or actually being able to scan the traffic that these uh, hackers were using when they exfiltrated you know, several terabytes of data off their network over 76 days. That expired certificate was in place for over 10 months which is, you know, inexcusable, okay? So keep your uh, certificates up to date uh, as well and make sure that your applications are actually working. So all, all of these are basics. These are not rocket science steps for security professionals. We, we know that these are bad habits. And, and speaking of rocket science, the next failure was in their databases. They didn't have anything separated. So their databases were not isolated from each other, naturally were able to leapfrog from one database to another using credentials they obtained in one database to get into the next. So we're able to leapfrog, leapfrog through the system and get to all sorts of information. And then da data governance, attackers gained access to database with unencrypted credentials to other databases. So the data, when they did get into a database, the data in, in those was not encrypted or protected, other, otherwise protected, and they were allowed to read that and get to where they needed to go. And then finally, there were no restrictions on the frequency of database queries. So these hackers ran 9,000 queries over a 76 day period and never were stopped. They never hit any, any lockout thresholds uh, identifying uh, unusual activity. So you have to ask yourself, if I'm Equifax and I've got 9,000 queries that are coming from some strange IP address or that look suspicious but I never catch them, am I culpable for a breach? So, so the question is, is, you know, is this the one that gets, you know, the overall question is, is this illness going to be the one that gets us? Um, and the jury's still out on Equifax because we don't know where the data went. As recently as just a few weeks ago, CNBC reported that security researchers have actually never seen the Equifax data on the dark web. So the prevailing theory right now is that some nation state actor actually was involved in the breach, has that information, and that they're using it in combination with data obtained from other breaches, in particular the data they got from the Office of Personnel Management's security background check breach in 2015. They're analyzing that and they're using that to identify spies working for the U.S. So, you know, are these people's lives at risk or their families' lives at risk? And they're also looking for using that to identify individuals that they can recruit to spy against U.S. interests, both government interests and corporate interests. And so this is actually still scary. Uh, this is out here. And so we don't know the state of the patient as a result of the Equifax breach. This is the slow-moving consequences that 
you know, no one individual will actually pay for unless you're, you know, working for the CIA. Um, I love the quote from one security research, researcher on this, going, knowing that an intelligence agency probably has the data, this researcher, his name's Jeffrey, he said he's also reading the news more often. He looks for stories about bribery, graft, spies being caught, or politicians suddenly spouting rhetoric in defense of hostile nations where they hadn't before. I think I'm going to be watching some news feeds someday a decade from now and see some politicians trying to do some crazy deal with some country we supposedly don't like. And I'm really going to wonder, am I finally seeing the Equifax data after all this time? So Ten years from now, when some politician turns, you'll know what happened. Well, he may also be running for, off, running for election and trying to court a new constituency, but either way. All right. Go ahead, Joe. So on that point, uh, we really would expect this. The, the reason why that's such a good theory is because we really would have expected this data to be out there on the black market, but it's not there. We haven't seen it yet. Okay, so what do dirty hands look like? These are uh, actual pictures that were taken during an audit uh, years ago. Uh, uh, it was one of, one of us, it was either Dave or me, I won't say who, um, took these pictures. But um, on the left you'll and see- And it wasn't at net documents. It wasn't at net documents. <laughs> uh, the password is right there on the person's laptop, um, out in the open for everybody to see. On the right, you see a picture of a business card that's holding a bolt to a network closet where you open the door and you plug right into the company's corporate network. No problem. These are dirty hands. So is there a chlorine solution for cyber attacks? What is an organization's duty of care in light of modern security threats? Well, we'd like to consider uh, a uh, role-based exposure graduate, in other words, b based on your role in the organization, a model for cyber hygiene. For Based on your role, what is cyber hygiene for, for you? So we'll be talking about what that means here in just a minute. So the attack vectors to an organization are um, access privileges, uh, authentication mechanisms, so if you have weak authentication, as we talked about in, in previous discussions, as the speakers mentioned, um, this is a, a huge area of uh, threat to an organization. So, so double your passwords, you know, multi-factor or uh, two or better on, on, on those factors of authentication. Patch, as we talked about here earlier, bring your own devices. Um, this is a threat, an ongoing threat. Phishing, uh, ongoing threat. Malware, uh, port scanning, malicious insiders. So these are all typical threats to your organization. By the way, one, one thing we, we, that kind of gets lost in this is your remote workers. So what kind of security do you have in place for, you know, are, what kind of vulnerabilities do your remote workers represent? Uh, if they're on their home internet, uh, is their router managed by Comcast? You know, is that a risk to your organization? Uh, or should they be running their own? Uh, how involved is your own IT staff in, in helping your remote users actually secure their home networks and their devices? That's, that's actually a pretty commonly missed risk area. So third party risk is increasing and it continues to increase because we rely on third parties for large portions of our security. So when it comes to a risk assessment, make sure that your risk assessment covers third parties or that your third party risk assessment process is robust because that continues to grow, that whole area, the supply chain. So traditional perimeter, hard out outer shell, soft inner shell. Um, as time went on, we started understanding how to layer our protection. So you'll, you'll hear about the layered model and there's all kinds of protections now in networks including uh, compartmentalization, micro-virtualization, et cetera. So, and, and yet, companies are very porous today. We, we, are, um, we, are, we don't have the traditional security uh, firewalled uh, perimeter, or, or we do, but there's lots coming in from the outside. So you have to look at those, uh, those mobile devices and 
um, VPN connections and er everyone that's coming in from the outside into your network. So here's the model that we're proposing to base on your role. <coughs> Level one is non-public facing roles. We think that uh, folks that are not public publicly facing should still receive some level of training for cyber hygiene. That's going to be the most modest level of training, but nevertheless, uh, a form of training is necessary for, for just about, well, it, for everyone. Um, second level is public facing roles. So these are going to be folks like customer support staff, receptionists, receiving clerks, HR folks. These are folks that are dealing with public uh, personnel and we believe that they need not just cyber hygiene, but they need to be educated in cyber health. So we're adding an additional layer of, of training for those folks. For your third levels, these are roles with substantial impact to the organization. Um, these are going to be your programmers, your Q QA people, testers, and even lawyers. And I'll, uh, so we think that lawyers need not just cyber hygiene education or cyber health education, but we also believe they need to have some law enforcement and uh, legal education when it comes to cyber. Dave, you want to mention well, something on say, that? I was just going to say, don't, you know, lawyers in, in particular do have a, an ethical obligation to ensure, uh, you know, if you look at the model rules, they've got a, an ethical obligation to understand the technology being used and also understand, make sure that the people reporting to them uh, understand and are following good security practices. Um, that, you know, lawyers are, are obligated to uh, obtain assistance and, uh, and counsel with uh, other experts where they lack their own knowledge. But, uh, you know, failure to do this uh, is not something that a, a, that a lawyer in particular can pass off to somebody else. This is the kind of thing that has career, as our IT, direct, IT vice president says, career, uh, has career implications if you uh, fail in this regard. Mm -hmm. So as in, a, in a supervisory uh, uh, response position. And lastly uh, are the, what we call the level four, what I'm calling the level four uh, security folks. These are the folks that know the most about security in your organization, including your system administrators, your database administrators, your CTO, C CISO. And these folks are, are going to need them. You know, they are going to need the CISSP certifications and, and, uh, and that kind of a thing. And, and have the most training. And so we, we think that military combat, uh, that language ported in from military, um, we use that all the time in security. The chlorine solution for cyber attack needs to address at least three areas. Uh, we need to address the chlorine, uh, we need to address the people area, the process area, and the technology area. And as we heard earlier uh, in an earlier presentation this morning, uh, the people is your weakest link. Um, so we're going to focus a little more uh, in, in the remainder of this presentation on the people aspect. But um, of course, we need um, controls and processes and into te technology. So when it comes to people, um, it's often been said that they are the, the weakest link to security organization. I think that proves uh, to be true over and over. So how do you uh, help people understand their duty um, for cyber, uh, f for protecting against cyber attack? Well, the first one is they need to be educated. So awareness, training, they, there needs to be a repeated type of awareness uh, programs in your organization to help them understand the, the need for this. Um, this includes web apps, how you use social media, your mobile devices, etc. Um, get the people that need to be certified certified, and there's a few certifications up there for training. Perform regular exercises, so uh, red team countermeasures, so if you've heard of red team, blue team, uh, there's a new uh, form of uh, solutions now. They're called breach and attack simulation scenarios where you can have um, scenarios that are happening constantly to, to uh, help your uh, defenders def defend themselves against attacks. 
Uh, there's a whole uh, slew of solutions that are coming out in the last two years in this area. So we, you're simulating a breach uh, attacks scenarios. Um, incident response, of course. Um, business, uh, business continuity and disaster recovery responses. Um, and then networking. Encourage networking. Make sure that folks are going to conferences like this. Um, and then there you have your ISACs, your information sharing and analysis centers. There's, a, there's ISACs for just about every sector out there. So there's an ISAC for healthcare. There's an ISAC for um, financial sector. Um, look look uh, for the ISAC uh, uh, that's in your sector. And then, of course, <coughs> you've got InfraGuard at the FBI. Uh, Department of Homeland Security has the NCCIC. Uh, so there's a lot of material available to educate yourself. Other examples of dirty hands in the organization. Dave, you want to take this? Well, these are classics. For the classic ones, delaying hardware soft classics ones are delaying hardware, software, and OS upgrades. I've long said that you need to upgrade your version of Microsoft Office and your Windows once a decade, whether you want to or not. By the way, Windows is approaching end of Windows 7 is approaching end of support, so it might be time to update if you haven't already. Uh, shutting off or ignoring alerts and updates. Stop hitting the snooze button on your security. Uh, Ray pointed out this morning they have I been pwned, pawned, owned, whatever that actually is. I have my so have never actually been able to figure out how that one's pronounced. But do go check that. Uh, it can be a very enlightening, shocking, and uh, terrifying experience. Uh, written passwords, lifehacker.com, if you go on there and search, most, commonly place, most common places for finding passwords, it'll shock you. Um, the, uh, although Joe's example of the password stuck to the front of the keyboard is actually pretty <coughs> rare. On the other side of the keyboard is pretty common. Uh, unencrypted storage, especially for mobile devices. So uh, the ABA in the 2018 uh, secur cybersecurity review pointed out that security experts at this point consider encryption on mobile devices, laptops, and smartphones to be a no-brainer solution. So lawyers in the crowd, if your smartphone is not encrypted, you are below the minimum standard for reasonableness in, co in caring for your client's information. And again, that has career impacting result, uh, consequences, or can have. Failing to use built-in mobile security. Again, if, if it's there, if it's free, turn it on. Um, it may not be the best solution available to you, but it's better than nothing. Uh, that's basically how you can sum up BitLocker, but it's there. So, uh, Unescorted visitor access to your facilities. Are you letting contractors and maintenance people wander around your offices without being escorted? Are you watching those people when they're in your spaces? Are your spaces secured? Uh, and then building physical security as well. Uh, and then employee and contractor background checks and screening. Uh, our company runs full background checks on all employees uh, on hire and, and then does it again annually. So uh, are you doing the same thing and are you asking that of your contractors? Yeah, and I would encourage you guys to look, uh, for those of you who are responsible for the area, to look at the type of background checks that you're getting because there really are a whole gamut of types of background checks. and. Make sure that the types of background checks are adequate to the level of sensitivity of the data that, that your organization is responsible for. Um, I think that should be part of a risk assessment. So we've heard about some of these practical steps. Um, the NIST cybersecurity framework was, re was mentioned several times. Um, in uh, the technical session, the last technical session, if you uh, attended that. This one is from uh, Carnegie Mellon. There's 11 steps here, and what they did to come up with these 11 steps was they consulted uh, a UK's top 10, the NIS, or sorry, the uh, CIS uh, top 20, used to be called the SANS top 20, uh, and a bunch more. They're all listed on the right there. I'm not sure if you can read it or not, but they'll be in your slide deck. Anyway, these 11 are excellent uh, for small to medium organizations and even large organizations as far as basic cyber hygiene. 
So for example, you want to look at your um, uh, organizational services products and supporting access. You're going to look at your supply chain. So supply chain, as I said earlier, is getting big. Um, you want to look at an incident response plan. Make sure you have a, a plan to respond to incidents when they come up. Um, and I'll let you read through the rest there. But this is a, an excellent uh, source just by virtue of how much they've distilled down into from these other sources, uh, these 11 steps. I was going to say, my one of my primary responsibilities is working with our customers uh, to complete vendor assessments. Yeah. Uh, when law firms that use net documents, they, you know, Joe's pointed out here, you should be con doing uh, assessments on your vendors. I can tell you that we're probably not getting assessment requests and requests for this kind of information from maybe 10 to 15% of our customers. Again, law firms. So there's, the world has a long way to go in this regard in terms of really making sure their downline and their, their contractors are adequately protecting the information they're being trusted with. But kudos to the 10 to 15% who are grilling me daily. <laughs> These are uh, one of the sets of controls that Carnegie Mellon, in producing their list, uh, uh, con uh, draw, drew from. Um, these are excellent controls. That they've been around for a number of years. They're tried and true, and they're the most bang for the buck type of controls. Um, we're not going to go through the, these in detail. Uh, a few years ago, the, S the Center for Cybersecurity, uh, Center for Internet Security, and the National Governors Association uh, for Homeland Security launched a cyber hygiene campaign. They've, they've since pulled that off their website, but these are the five steps that they had. Um, again, these are excellent um, big bang for the buck kind of uh, controls to put in place. You want to count uh, what's connected to your network, configure them properly, limit and manage those who have admin privileges, patch, and then repeat the process. So the ACSCs, this is the Australian uh, Signal Controls Directorate. They're uh, essential con con eight controls. This does a great job uh, of, you know, s of implementing the 80-20 rule. So they've got application whitelisting, patching applications. So really controlling what's, what's running on your machines as well as making sure that what is running is up to date. Configuring Microsoft Office macro settings. Uh, believe it or not, macros are still an issue. Uh, not as much anymore, but people leave that door open all the time. Application hardenings. Uh, making sure workstations and servers are protected, uh, restricting ad administrative privileges and using separate logins for administrative functions, patching operating systems, multi-factor authentication. As, they sa as, as we've said today, as other people have said, you know, multi-factor authentication is going to be the big thing in the next year or two. Uh, there's really no substitute for using it, no excuse not to use it where it's available. And then maintaining daily ba backups of your data. So if something does happen, you can get back to it and get back up and running. Critical to business continuity. So I put, we put this slide in here. Um, I mentioned monitoring your home network or even your small business network. This is actually a screenshot from a consumer grade modem, but showing you the kind of information that's now available uh, to consumers and small enterprises in terms of managing their network. It's not difficult to do this stuff uh, and monitor things. <coughs> So multi-factor, for those of you who haven't heard, means at least two of something you know, such as your password, something you have, such as a, a public uh, key or a, a crypto token, um, and something you are, such as your fingerprint or your, uh, uh, your uh, retina scan. Yep. If there's nothing you take away from this, from this uh, presentation, take away these items. Absolutely. Perform a risk assessment. Um, again, more tips and takeaways. And some of the technologies that can help. And there's additional references. So that's, that's our last slide. Um, we have time for any questions. Any questions? Okay. Yes, yes, in the back.
What we've done is, first off, that information does not go out without an NDA, uh, which means we do not let our salespeople handle it. Sorry if they're sitting back there, but, uh, you know, because salespeople have a tendency, oh, you want it, just hand it out. So first off, we've got to have an NDA in place. We will hand out under S NDA our third-party assessments, our ISO certificates and our SOC 2 report. Uh, we have a couple of policy documents that we will distribute in full, but on things like the password policy, the remote device policy, all of those things where there's a lot of sensitive information about how we do things, we will distribute the table of contents from those written policies, but that's it. So uh, we will also discuss our vulnerability assessments and our penetration tests, but only in a remote session. We will not pass that stuff out at all, we'll, but we'll get on the phone with them and talk about the, uh, you know, the, the, what findings there were and what we've done to mitigate them. Yeah. So there is justification to push back. And yes, no is, is you know, going to be, it, that might not be enough. We, we like to say yes or no, but... Well, yeah, we're, but we're, we're getting those requests from our customers, so we know, we know that they've got some data stored in our system. We have no idea what it is. But that's, uh, yeah, we have no visibility into the content of the documents people store in our system. So we actually take the default position that, it's got, that everything is sensitive and we treat it all the same, at the same at our highest classification level.